start uh, exactly on time. The first speaker is Soumya Perry. She's talking about furrowing deep the rodent way, a clinical approach to a case of atypical murin's ulcer. So I think after your time is up, the slides st uh, stop showing because I saw a lot of speakers continue speaking. After that, they don't know that the audience is not seeing the slides. So please keep that in mind. Once your time is up, you can stop. Sure. Good morning. So I present a case of a 65-year-old male who presented with redness, pain in the right eye since three months with, emissions, uh, with episodes of remissions and exaggerations. He had no history of any systemic illness and best corrected visual acuity of 6 by 12. On slit lamp examination, as we can see, a crescentric-shaped ulcer in the inferior peripheral cornea with undermined central edge at the ulcer base and 90% thinning was noted. No evidence of scleritis was seen. Anterior staphyloma with 360-degree vascularization may be due to past history of trauma as told by the patient was noted in the left time. All the investigations that were done were negative for the patient. So a provisional diagnosis of Moorin's ulcer was made in the absence of scleritis, in the absence of any other systemic associations to the patient. So the patient was started on topical steroids, lubricants, and oral doxycycline. So the inferior crescentic shaped ulcer showed signs of healing with conjectalization of the inferior cornea. And the patient was lost to follow up after six months. So when he presented again after six months to us, he was using topical steroids without tapering. So on slit lamp examination, a crescentric shaped ulcer in the inferior peripheral cornea with 90% thinning with perforation, which was serials positive, was noted this time with best corrected visual acuity of 6 by 36. So steroids were withheld temporarily. In view of perforation, which was noted, probably due to chronic use of steroids, and antibiotics, lubricants, and oral doxycycline were given. Conjectival resection was done. BCL and glue were applied at the perforation site. So on restarting the topical steroids, there was progression again with inferior active thinning from 3 to 9 o'clock position and plugging of the iris inferiorly. Hence, again, we stopped the topical steroids. So this time, we continue with oral steroid 60 mg in tapering doses along with oral doxycylin along with the other conventional medical management that we had started. Inferior patch grafting was done for the patient after two weeks as the inferior crescentric ulcer had no signs of healing and the vision of the patient was counting fingers one meter now. So post patch graft, the patient was continued on topical and oral steroids along with the other line of management. So at three weeks post-op, graft melt with peripheral vascularization was noted. Hence tablet cyclosporin 50 milligram twice a day after physician clearance was started along with the existing medical management. So in the last follow-up, circumferential healing with peripheral vascularization and central spreading with active central margin was noted as seen in the last picture in the last follow-up. So despite best of a medical and surgical management, whatever we could give in our institute, the vision was hand movements PLPR. So why this case? We present a case of a typical malignant bilateral progressive form of Moorin's ulcer in a 65-year-old man, which is painless and aggressive since its presentation, which is usually seen in younger patients. Perforation of Moorin's ulcer, which is also seen in younger patients, was noted on chronic use of topical steroids. The patient was refractive to all other available therapies, and this resulted in severe visual morbidity of the patient. The patient and attenders were resistant to be attend uh, to be referred to a higher center. So thank you. So I would like to know how else we could we have managed this case in a better way so that we could salvage the eye. Any suggestions, please let us know. Thank you. Did you start the patient on cyclophosphamide or was it only the oral Cyclosporin steroids? only, ma'am. First we started with or topical steroids, but uh, repeated perforations were happening. Uh, so we went for oral steroids and then we went for cyclosporin, ma'am. Oral? You went yeah, for oral, ma'am. I think uh, we pretty much managed. I think the main thing was that the patient we presented, it was more than two quadrant of involvement. And you did work up and then you started topical steroid, patient went back. So basically this disease is a dis uh, disease of exclusion and this is an autoimmune disease. So it needs systemic preparation on the day one. You have more than ulcer present on your OPD day one, give IVMP three doses, do the conjunctival resection same day with TABCL. Otherwise, it will go on and perforate. And th this topical steroid will not take care of, care of this thing. So there is a step ladder approach. You start with oral steroids, go to immunosuppression. You start with the cyclosporine, then you go to azathioprine, mycophenolate, cyclophosphamide, 
biological inhibitor. So topical steroids will not take care of more than one third. Okay. Yes, yeah. Like if it's bilaterally atypical, it's very aggressive. It's known to be aggressive. So even your management has to be. Actually, yeah. the patient presented to us, the other eye was anterior saplomatous. So he was giving a past history of trauma. But trauma is also one of the causes of mood and sulfur. So we don't know if it was unilateral or it was bilateral. Basically, unilateral aggressive is more seen in elderly males. But this case is a bilateral aggressive mood and sulfur, which is normally seen in younger patients, but we see in a 65 year old man. So it's a great case for learning. So if you see such a patient where you're already there's a staphyloma, I think you should keep it in mind that it is a bilateral disease. Thank you, thank you thank so you. much. Can we have the next speaker up, please? Uh, Soumya is talking on uh, a case of corneal graft rejection and reversal. Uh, good morning, one and all. Uh, I'm Dr. Soumya Vagesna, uh, Konya Fellow from Vision TI Hospital, uh, Vishakapatnam. Uh, today, I would like to speak about uh, a case of corneal graft rejection and reversal just in time. Scope of my presentation includes introduction, case report, discussion, management, and conclusion. Introduction, cornea's relative immune privilege as a transplanted tissue Allogenic rejection is the most frequent reason for corneal graft failure. It should be appropriately identified and differentiated from other causes of graft failure that are not immune mediated like the primary donor failure. So the diagnosis of a graft rejection, uh, mainly it is based on the grafts that have remained clear for at least two weeks following transplantation. The survival percentage for low risk PKP Primary grafts with immunosuppression has been reported to be as high as 95% at 5 years. In contrast, failure rates for high-risk recipients such as those who have corneal vascularization can easily reach 35% at 3 years. So coming to the case report, a 64-year-old male had, who had undergone penetrating keratoplasty for adherent leukoma left eye um, and for 2 years the corneal graft was clear with best corrected visual acuity of 6 by 36. He suddenly presented to us with pain associated with decreased vision and his best, best corrected visual acuity dropped to CF 1 meter. On slit lamp examination, there were DM folds and stromal edema and the graft was relatively hazy. Uh, management, we admitted the patient and administered oral steroids along with extensive uh, intensive topical steroids. The patient showed dramatic improvement in vision to 6 by 60 with decreased corneal edema and DM folds over the next 48 hours. Discussion, cornea being an immune privileged organ, the success rate is higher in keratoplasty compared to other transplantations. The other factors playing a vital role in this success are avascularity and lack of lymphatics. Risk factors that raise the possibility of rejection during corneal transplant surgery such as preoperative inflammation, corneal neovascularization, more than two quadrants, young recipient age, iris sinica to the uh, graft margin, large grafts, loose sutures, and prior graft rejection. So immune reaction can involve different layers of transplant like epithelial, subepithelial, endothelial, and mixed. Um, in uh, uh, endothelial rejection, there is a white line on the corneal endothelium, which is called as a codedos line, and also keratic precipitates may be seen. It is always advisable to reduce the active inflammation in the recipient's eye prior to transplantation. And uh, topical steroids are the primary mode of treatment. Epithelial and subepithelial rejection, topical corticosteroids can be used too early with a tapered dosing over six to eight weeks. And severe endothelial rejection, topical corticosteroids prescribed hourly, that is prednisolone acetate or difluprednate along with systemic therapy can be used. Calcineurin inhibitors like uh, cyclosporin and tacrolimus are viable options in patients in whom corticosteroids are contraindicated. So conclusion, patient education regarding the early symptoms of graft rejection followed by early detection and timely intervention can have favorable outcomes in cases of corneal graft rejection. Diagnosis of graft rejection should be made as early as possible by an ophthalmist and this plays a vital role in the management of corneal graft rejection. These are my references. Thank you. My patient had endothelial type of graft rejection, sir. And he gave topical steroids. 
uh, we get topical steroids prescribed by Navalli along with uh, tacrolimus and also cyclosporin. And also oral I uh, oral steroids also, sir. Yeah, so the Yeah, uh, I agree with him. There's no role of oral steroids. Uh, just topical steroids initially works well. However, the patient is one-eyed and it's a, uh, like, you know, a repeat graft and it's a high-risk graft. Then I have given IV methylprednisolone in these cases. So you give it over uh, three days. You can give three, like, you know, three cycles. And uh, oral steroids, however, has no role. Topical uh, steroid, uh, topical RD steroids t uh, works well in most cases. And only if it's a high-risk case, you'll be giving IV steroids. But it's a well-managed case. Thank yes. you so much. Thank you. Can we have the mic on for sir, please? Can someone from audiovisual come and help us with the mic? best time to give the IV uh, MP also. It works well in the first three days. That's the reason counseling for your patients also is very important. That if your eye becomes red, if your vision drops, you need to report SOS to the hospital when, within the first 24 hours. Yes. That's, that's most important. Can we also have the next speaker set, come up, please? Good morning, everyone. I'm Dr. Aditi, and I'm presenting a case report on the enigma of post keratoplasty localized bleed. Patient was a 23-year-old male, known case of keratoglobus, uh, with no systemic illness. He presented to our center with history of pain, redness, watering, and diminution of vision in right eye. On examination, we found a large 9 into 10 mm corneal ulcer. Patient underwent ther therapeutic keratoplasty using a large graft of 11 mm. <coughs> and the culture report of the infected tissue showed fusarium keratitis. Two months post-operatively, patient presented to our center with a complaint of sudden bleed in the eye. There was no history of trauma to the right eye. On examination, there was a localized bleed in the temporal part of the graft. The temporal part of the graft contains sclera, since it was a large graft, and a, do a part of the donor sclera was included in the graft. And the bleed was restricted only to the sclera and did not cross the corneoscleral junction. Section through the uh, bleed did not reveal much details due to posterior shadowing. The patient was managed conservatively and the bleed resolved over the next month. You can see in the clinical picture that the bleed has completely resolved and we can see the part of the sclera of the donor tissue. ASOCT on the last follow-up showed, uh, the, you can see in the lower arrow showed the decimate membrane while the upper arrow shows the graft hose junction. We can see that the thickened decimate membrane is not reaching up to the graft hose junction which further confirms the presence of the scleral tissue. So to discuss the possible cause and why it was localized, we need to know about the anatomy of the co uh, cornea and the sclera. The collagen fibrils in the corneal stroma have a uniform diameter of 25 to 35 nanometer, and they are arranged regularly in a uh, lamella pattern. Whereas in the sclera, they have a wide range of diameters, ranging from 25 to 230 nanometers, and they have a random arrangement in bundles and are separated by large empty spaces. Any microbleed may have then progressed through the scleral tissue, but could not cross the uh, could not cross into the cornea because of the uh, tight lamellar arrangement. To the best of our knowledge, this is the first such reported case of bleed in a large graft involving donor scleral tissue. These are the references. Thank you. You had bleeding in the sclera part. Only in the scleral part, sir. Yes. Then why you are worried about that bleeding? Uh, we were not worried, so it was, we just managed conservatively. We just wanted to uh, report that this is the first such case which we have seen. About bleeding in the Clear graph? Only, yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Aditi. Uh, can we have the next speaker, Mosmi Anand? She's uh, talking about deathness stripping endothelial keratoplasty for graft failure after a keratoplast, a full thickness keratoplasty.
गुड मॉर्निंग एवरी वन माई सेल्फ डॉक्टर मौसम आनंद आई एम प्रजेंटिंग अ केस ऑफ फोर्टी टू ईयर्स ओल्ड मेल केम टू आवर ओ पी डी विथ चीफ कंप्लेन ऑफ डेमिनेशन ऑफ विजन पेन इन राइट आई सिंस वन ईयर फॉरन बॉडी सेंसेशन इन राइट आई सिंस वन ईयर हिस्ट्री ऑफ प्रजेंटिंग इलनेस पेसन हैथ पेन एंड डेमिनेशन ऑफ विजन राइट आई ऑन एंड ऑफ सिंस वन ईयर gradually progressive associated with redness foreign body sensation and other visual symptoms no history of fever sore throat any cutaneous lesion or auditory disorder past ocular history patient had history of right eye injury by vegetative matter 9 year back visited local doctor and managed conservatively but condition didn't improve due to corneal opacity development post keratoplasty penetrating keratoplasty surgery and after 2 year phaco emulsification and toric il implantation done past medical history no history of any systemic illness like diabetes mellitus hypertension family history are not relevant social history belongs to lower class group general examination pallor ictus cyanosis clubbing lymphadenopathy edema absent all other systems are not abnormally detectable on in ocular examination right eye best corrected visual acuity finger count close to face in left eye 6 by 6 iop by application tonometry 14 mm hg in right eye in left 12 mm hg Conjunctival congestion present in right eye, edematous cornea, DM fold present, graft hazy, anterior chamber, iris, pupil are not assessed in right eye. Whereas in left eye, all are within normal limit. Lens in right eye pseudo phacic according to history. In left eye, it's clear. On examination, right eye anterior segment findings are graft host junction present, 16 suture marks present, graft hazy, DM folds present, edematous cornea. My case summary is 42 year old male with complaint of diminution of vision and increased pain in right eye. Patient had a history of right eye injury by vegetative matter 9 year back due to corneal opacity, PKP and graft 2 year toric IL implantation done. On ocular examination there was finger count close to face, conjunctival congestion, edematous cornea, DM fold present graft hazy. Differential diagnosis are endothelial decompensation, late graft failure, post operative corneal edema, infectious endophthalmitis. All routine investigations are within normal limit. Screening tests are non-reactive. B scans in B scan retina on. Pachymetry was measured. Right eye central corneal thickness seven seven eighty one micron meter. AS OCT shows corneal thickness. Right eye AS OCT showing graft wall attached. In right eye central corneal thickness seven eighty one micro meter. In left eye four ninety two micro meter. My provisional diagnosis is the right eye graft failure. Patient plan for right eye dissect due to right eye graft failure. Right eye dissect done. POD one interface clear. Disc well opposed. Suture present. Epithelial fusion line present. Following advices were given with regular follow up. Tap prednisolone 40 milligram with ta in tapered dose. Eye drop moxidexa 0.5 percent W by V and 0.1 percent W by V. One drop four times. Eye drop hypersol 5 percent. One drop five times. Eye drop lubricant one drop three times. Follow up after 15 days. Right eye clear graft. Pupil normal shape. Reactive to light. Best corrective visual acuity 618. IOP 12 mm hg. To be continue on oral and topical steroid, which will be gradually tapered over several months. Thank you. Actually, nicely managed. Just one thing that uh, uh, after doing surgery, the why were the oral steroid were given? Yeah. There is no need of giving oral steroid in this case. Not even PK also. Do you have your post-operative photo? Did you yeah, show that? Yeah, sure. Showed it. Because there is a edematous cornea and topical cells will take care of. There is no role of oral steroids in any corneal transplants. Uh, when you've done, uh, did you mention about whether you stripped the desmids or you left did a non-stripping desmids uh, surgery? Stripping desmids. You stripped it completely. So, uh, in case of a corneal graft. You have to make sure that your stripping is like within the graft hose junction because otherwise the graft hose junction can open up. I think I don't know if you mentioned that point. And also non-stripping can also be done, so that is an alternate uh, which works well. Okay. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Then we have the next speaker, uh, Dr. Raghav Pritham. He's going. He's talking about alcohol woes, a tale of recurring and ha habit and corneal edema, habitual corneal edema, I guess. Everyone, uh, at the outset, I would like to thank AIOS for the opportunity. Uh, today's my topic is alcohol woes, a tale of recurring habit and corneal edema. 
directly jumping into the case is a 33 year old gentleman who is a bike mechanic hailing from Don Karnul district complains of sudden onset of pain redness and decrease in vision in the right eye he is giving a fair he is giving not so consistent history of trauma to the right eye and no other systemic associated history he is a social drinker and is a non smoker so on clinical presentation in the right eye vision was counting fingers uh, 2 meters and the iop was 24 millimeters of mercury we did it with nct not gat because of the following findings so on uh, diffuse direct illumination a total corneal edema limbus to limbus could be seen the same could be seen using a slit section where you can see gross increase in the corneal pachymetry and no kps or pigments were noted on the endothelium Uh, the same picture using a sclerotic scatter and on fluorescent staining a 4 into 4 mm epithelial defect could be noted so almost always i always have a presumptive diagnosis seeing the first time uh, sudden onset of edema corneal stromal edema i was thinking in lines of hsv before i just checked the other eye uh, grossly it looked fine but on looking it further closer you can see some dm folds on the slit section so then uh, there was no fluorescence stain was negative no epithelial defect so then the confusion started then i went back to the book and started seeing what are the possible causes first the clinical diagnosis uh, differential diagnosis was viral endothelitis secondary to hsv or cmv whether any toxins were used or whether the patient had any endothelial disorders like fecd pmcd none of which had consistent features the trauma history was there but i was not convinced with the amount of trauma and the extent of trauma in both the eyes and the last differential was drug induced whether uh, the patient was any on any of one among these medications so i went back uh, i asked him probed more questions to the history so there was no significant medical history or he was not on any drugs events from the previous night suggested an episode of binge alcohol drinking following which he developed the symptoms the next day morning he also rubbed his eyes vigorously possible reason for why he had an epithelial defect so i placed the bcl in the right eye started him with hourly steroids in the right eye and four hourly steroids in the left eye uh, atropine in the right eye for three times for the pain and paracetamol as, as well for the pain started him on biplex fort od uh, thinking that he might have some kind of a vitamin deficiency as well and was advised for complete abstinence from alcohol a basic serology workup was done which was within normal limits so this was one week later in the right eye vision improved to 636 bcl was removed iop was within normal limits left eye uh, came back to 66 and the iop was normal further two weeks later there was faint anterior stromal scarring and the vision improved to 612 in the right eye and iop was normal as well 18 mm of mercury so at this point of time i was very happy i showed the patient the pictures how it was how it is right now why it is important not to drink and 3 days later boom he comes with another episode of uh, drinking and the vision is back to 630 660 in the right eye and 636 in the left eye so again i stepped up the steroids uh, started him on astrazolamide because the pressures were borderline high uh, i advised him to go to a da addiction and rehab center that is the last i saw him he never came back to me again so to uh, quickly about the discussion temporary dysfunction of corneal endothelium with loss of endothelial cells is possible in, in uh, a uh, binge alcohol drinking this could be possibly due to prolonged hypoglycemia as well considering the temporal sequence uh, prominent resolution is expected uh, but complete visual recovery might not happen that is all what i had and these are my references and thank you uh, thank you for your wonderful uh, case i think uh, one case probably is too uh, smaller number to make the cause and effect bilateral viral endothelitis is also known to present uh, like this sometimes especially with you tapering the steroids and it come the recurrence coming back can also be attributed to that uh, maybe the others on the expert panel can comment i have seen one case of bilateral corneal melt after this alcohol binge drinking and we have done bilateral therapeutic pk it happens but we don't we can't make it like it is the cause of this we have seen yeah, no good uh, i would say very good documentation uh, except that the first picture the initial picture which was of a very diffuse edema on one eye and the other eye being almost normal that is inconsistent with uh, alcohol induced toxic endothelitis 
So we have just had a publication which is just accepted in the IGO and probably in the couple of months it will be coming up. And it would mostly confer with your picture that you showed in the second visit. The first visit is a bit too inconsistent. Yes. This is point number one. Point number two is sometimes alcoholism we may need to you know, gravitate towards thinking that alcohol might cause this. But they may have secondary infections and we had a very similar case like your first presentation and when we scraped, after five scrapings, we got atypical mycobacteria over there. So while this is plausible, what, what I'm saying is that this is, as in your very rightly pointed out differential, it's one of the rarest uh, Correct. prognosis, that is, uh, sorry, differentials that is there. So in that light, uh, I think otherwise, uh, I think it's, it's a wonderful case to document and discuss. Any audience also, we can take some inputs from there. Can someone hand the mic to ma'am? Meanwhile, can we have the next speaker set up, please? Yeah. Uh, starting from scratch and scanning till the end, uh, Nasreen. So, uh, she just asked about vitamin A deficiency causing uh, bilateral corneal edema. That is a plausible cause as well. The general systemic examination was normal. Uh, the CBC and the vitamin profile was normal for the patient. So, uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity. Vitamin A deficiency will not cause the edema. It goes melt. <laughs> no, no, no. Edema will not be there. Yeah, they may have, but edema will not be there. The melt you will see. Good morning, Dan. I am dealing with a resolved case of fungal endophthalmitis. A patient presented with the redness, watering, diminution of vision, history of cataract surgery five months back. Referred by a primary surgeon in view of ulcer cornea with hypopia, HM plus, PL, PR accurate. Superior crescentic stromal infiltrate with thinning, 2 mm hypopia, pupil visible, eye well, and other details not made out. Low plus negative, scraping done for KH mount, but no fungal filaments found. B scan showed dot echoes, mild RCS thickening. But retina, retina people told to observe for two days. We started Vigamox eye, eye drops hourly, fortified amicacin hourly, and uh, amoxicillin, cloxillin systemically. On 30th May, uh, superior crescentic stomal infiltrate thinning uh, was there. Hypopian increase, AC exudates and hypopian worsened. Fundus no view. Then we uh, start started uh, intravital vancomycin and amicacin and uh, oriconazole, AC with test stop done. On next post, uh, next uh, post up day, superior crescentic stromal infiltrate with corneal thinning was there. Temporal sutures and iris tissue uh, were, were done. Iris tissue was incarcerated. AC depth variable collapsed centrally, hypema present. Clinically, we are uh, treating as a uh, bacterial endophthalmitis. Vitreous tap showed fungal filaments. So we started him on oriconazole and tablet ketoconazole and intrastomal oriconazole given away from the thin car carnal area. And after two days, AC exudates were increasing. B scan vitreous echoes increased, RCS thickening was there. So, how to go ahead with the surgery, uh, with the patient? If vitreous surgeon want to do uh, uh, core vitrectomy, we may go for TPK, but they, uh, they don't want to do intervention. So if we do TPK, uh, risk of large graft, risk of graft rejection, and risk of secondary glaucoma. So we plan for IOL explantation, intracameral oriconazole and septazidum, intravitreal vancomycin, septazidum, and oriconazole, BCL over thin areas. AC was done. Membranes removed. And we removed the eye oil also. And intracameral intrastomal oricones will give it. And tissue adhesive applied over the thinned out areas. And BCL applied.
After two days, sutures intact, blue over thinned area present, uh, AC formed well, AC reaction plus FA care, witness exudates were decreasing, and we continued the same treatment. On 10th June, AC formed well, AC reaction decreased, FA care, exudates also. Um, in, uh, BC, um, in B scans, exudates increasing, so we uh, did repeat uh, intravital vancomycin, septazine, and voriconazole. After one week, patient was doing well. BCL glue was there, AC formed well, no exudates and no hypopian. Finally, we removed BCL, everything was when, went well. We planned for planning for SFL and PKP. What was the organism? Aspergillus, sir. They are very difficult and uh, very fastidious organisms. Actually, we don't want to do TPK unless the uh, retina people intervene. So now it is resolved. We are planning for PKP and SFL. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah, it was a well-managed case. Can you have the next speaker, please? Uh, Dr. Abhijit. Bilateral cilia incarnata in a breast carcinoma patient receiving trazumamab. Good morning, everyone. I will be presenting a rare case of bilateral senior incarnata in a breast carcinoma patient receiving transosomal. So a 50-year-old patient presented with foreign body sensation bilaterally for a couple of weeks. On examination, she had multiple ingrown misdirected lashes growing beneath the skin of both upper eyelids. Interior segment was normal and there was uh, bone gland dysfunction. The lashes were not touching cornea. So the uh, foreign body sensation was because of MGD. And patient had history of breast cancer treated with transtrosomab for 10 months at time of presentation. So this is the clinical picture. You can see multiple ingrown hair lashes. So cilia incarnata is a relatively rare entity in which eyelash hair are misdirected and grow under the skin. In this case, they were directed towards the subcutaneous place, subcutaneous plane. Hence, it was diagnosed as cilia incarnata externum. And transtrosomab is a HER2 receptor blocker which is used in management of breast carcinoma. And since uh, the lashes were not touching, so no, and uh, patient was, the, the discomfort was because of MGD, so no uh, epilation was done. So it is a, uh, it targets human epidermal receptor family, and a tufted folliculitis has been reported post transtrosomal therapy. And there has been a hypothesis that HER2 receptor in skin can uh, the blocking of HER2 receptor in skin can cause papillopustular eruption via HER2, HER1 uh, interaction. And we hypothesize that a similar mechanism could have affected hair follicle. And such significant cilia incarnata, multiple hair lesions, both the eyelids, uh, both the eyes and upper eyelids have not been reported previously. Thank you. Very interesting observation. And uh, did you do anything? Because you said the patient was symptomatic. She came with a foreign body sensation. Yeah. Uh, so, ma'am, uh, symptoms were because of the MGD. So we uh, treated for that, and she resolved. How have you treated her? We gave her azithromycin eye drops uh, three times a day. Then we gave her lubricant and advised hot fermentation. So she resolved with that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Can we have the next speaker, Dr. Lavanya? Speaking about a case of cryptococcal scleritis, which is mimicking scleromalacia perforans. Good morning, everyone. I'm presenting a case of cryptococcal scleritis mimicking scleromalacia perforans. 83-year-old male patient, farmer from a low socioeconomic background, presented with complaint of redness and mild pain in the right eye associated with occasional discharge for three months. There was no history of trauma and no known systemic illness. On systemic examination, patient was found to have high fasting blood sugar levels and was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes mellitus and was started on medication. Coming to the ocular examination, uh, the right eye had uh, best character vision of 2 by 60. There was a two in, 3 into 2.5 mm epithelial defect in the cornea with limbal stem cell deficiency and perilimbal thinning. 
and in the sclera there was scleral thinning noted in the infratemporal quadrant as seen in the picture and lens PCIOL was present and fundus was normal left eye findings were normal uh, investigations in, uh, in systemic investigation protein blood investigations were done and it was normal except for elevated blood sugar level and rheumatological and immunological profile was negative and imaging showed normal study and coming to microbiological investigation conjectural swab was sent from both the eyes which revealed no growth and scraping was sent from the site of the lesion and it was negative for both bacterial and fungal despite syst extensive systemic and ocular investigation yielding normal results patient didn't uh, show any signs of improvement with the topical antibiotics, steroids and lubricants. So a diagnosis of right eye sclerosis perforance was made and patient underwent right eye amniotic membrane grafting with glue and sutures as seen in the picture. On two weeks follow up, patient had symptomatic relief and best character visual acuity was 6 by 60. But when the patient presented at one month follow up, there was worsening in the inferior and the inferotemporal scleral thinning and overlying uh, remnant, uh, along with the overlying remnants of AMG and suture. So patient underwent right eye scleral patch graft under general anesthesia because of the risk of uh, perforation under block and scleral tissue sample was sent for histopathological examination which revealed cryptococcal species. These are the histopathology images. First slide uh, shows the uh, HND staining in 20x magnification, characteristic granulomatous inflammation with Jain cells and uh, GMS stain with 40 in under 40x magnification which shows the brown black round or oval structures of different sizes characteristic of cryptococcus. Diagnosis of uh, ocular cryptococcus scleritis was made and patient was referred for systemic evaluation to know the focus of infection, but there was no abnormality and patient was started on topical and systemic antifungal agents and there was complete resolution of ocular symptoms. Cryptococcal uh, discussion, cryptococcal infection is generally caused by crypt uh, cryptococcus neoformans. It is an uncommon infection, but is generally seen in the individuals who are immunosuppressed, mainly HIV patients, but can also be seen in organ transplant individuals and uncontrolled diabetics. It generally occurs as an asymptomatic pulmonary infection in immunocompetent individuals. And contact with the PGN excreta is an important predisposing factor. And the most common manifestation is papilledema due to central nervous system involvement, including other manifestations like optic atrophy and extraocular muscle paresis. And chorioretinitis and endophthalmitis are usually bloodborne infections in immunocompromised individuals. There are case reports of cryptococcal uveitis presenting secondary to meningoencephalitis even in immunocompetent individuals and cryptococcal keratitis after keratoplasty was also reported. There are reports of cryptococcal infection presenting as granulomatous conjunctivitis but to the best of our knowledge there was no previous reports of isolated primary ocular involvement of cryptococcal infection. A conclusion, cryptococcal infections involving the ocular surface can exhibit clinical manifestation resembling inflammatory scleritis or scleromalacia perforans. So distinction based on the entities is cr uh, crucial due to difference in the management approaches in between the two. These are my references. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I think it's a well-managed case. Only thing if it was a progressive condition in the first time when the patient was taken for the AMG, maybe at the same sitting a scleral biopsy could have been done because anyways the patient was taken under the operating okay. table but otherwise I think it's a well managed case. Thank you. Just uh, one point, how would you make the distinction that this is not secondary to the surgery and it's a primary cryptococcus scleritis? Is it possible that post-surgery this is a secondary infection? No, sir, like previous swab and all were taken already. Pre previous uh, scrapings were also sent, so it was negative at that time also. So scleritis can be negative and may need multiple scrapings yes. because of the nature of the tissue. And otherwise well managed, uh, when you mention, mention cryptococcus spores, not cryptococcal. Okay. Cryptococcal is in the context yeah, of yes, uveitis, uveitis, spheritis, but otherwise it's the microbiology correct. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Then we have our next speaker, Dr. Shravani Sarkar, talking on proptosis in young female and its association with high ASO titer. Can we request the next speaker, uh, Dr. Shilpa, to please be ready because we have a lot of speakers and I don't know if we have enough time. Good morning, everyone. I'm Dr. Shravani and I'm be presenting a, a, a study on this uh, proptosis in a young female and its association with high ASO titer. Uh, our patient is a 13-year-old female who presented with proptosis of the right eye since 15 days, but insidious in onset and gradually progressive associated with dimness of vision in the right eye. There was no recent history of fever and no history of trauma. In medical history, there was no history of autoimmune disease. Uh, there was history of sore throat and fever four months back. In the family history, there was no history of any autoimmune diseases. This is a picture of the uh, patient where we can see uh, right eye is proptosed. 
uh, visual acuity was 618 uh, in the right eye, whereas it was normal in the left eye. On external examination, there was proptosis with Hertel's exophthalmometer. The measurement of protrusion came around 24 uh, millimeters, while on the left side, it was uh, 21. Uh, in the lid, it, there was mild ptosis present. The rest of the examination uh, were no within normal limit. Uh, ocular motility, uh, motility, it was restricted in the right eye, uh, laterally, superior, temporally, superior nasally, as well as superiorly, whereas it was normal in the left eye. Fundus examination so uh, disc in a matters with a blurred disc margin on the right side. Investigations all routine blurred investigations like RBS, CVC, CRP, ESR, LFT, LFT, KFT, everything and uh, thyroid profile was done which was within normal limit. ASO titer was high which was 563 international units per ml. On USG B scan there was proptosis of the right eye and there was heterogeneously enhancing ill-defined soft tissue lesion in the right orbital effect extending into the intraconal compartment with encasing the optic nerve and the superior rectus muscle with associated fast strangling. MRI orbit was also done, which showed similar finding of proptosis and ill-defined heterogeneously enhancing lesion with high signal intensity seen involving the retrobulbar fat, both intracolon and extracolon. Extraocular muscles in, were involved, lacrimal gland and soft tissue of the preceptal compartment of the right orbit with there was medial, displa uh, medial displacement and compression of the optic nerve. Uh, based on the investigations, uh, we arrived at the diagnosis of orbital pseudotumor or idiopathic orbital inflammatory syndrome. Patient was started on injection dexamethasone, 4 mg IM BD for seven days after which uh, it was tapered. Uh, injection ceftriaxone was also started, 200 mg IV BD for seven days and uh, eye drop moxifloxacin one drop six times daily was started. After two days, there was significant improvement in the proptosis and vision improved to six by nine in the right eye. And after one week, there was complete resolution of the proptosis and vision. Uh, based on our uh, uh, findings, we, uh, we looked into some of the studies which also had, like uh, patients had orbital myositis associated with history of streptococcal pharyngitis. Discussion. Although uh, causes of orbital pseudotumor is often unknown, it is commonly associated with autoimmune disorders, but in our case, it was not there. Few studies have shown instances of orbital myositis associated with streptococcal pharyngitis, particularly in pediatric age group. Uh, Immune-mediated post-streptococcal inflammation of the ocular muscles could be one of the causes. In our case, there's also, there was also compression of the optic nerve, leading to diminution of vision. Thank you. Uh, and injection dexamethasone was starting. And you've investigated for thyroid? Yes, ma'am. A very good morning, everyone. I am Dr. Shilpa Tarni, Konya faculty at LB Prasada Institute, Vishakapatnam. Today, I'll be presenting a case where we retrieved a posteriorly dislocated uh, DSEC lenticule, which was later on attached, and uh, it, the graft was found to be functional at the end of six months. DSEC in FAK chiasis and iris tissue loss is challenging because there is higher chance of dislocation into posterior segment due to lack of iris lens diaphragm. Lenticule detachment rates can be as high as 16.7% in complicated cases. And surgical removal of the disloca posteriorly dislocated grafts and re reattachment of the same graft is challenging. Here is a case of 72-year-old male with right eye brown cataract and left eye pseudophakia who underwent an even eventful cataract surgery in right eye. And he landed up with aphakia, iris tissue loss, and a decimate detachment. He underwent desmetopexy one week later, but then four months later, he presented with bullous keratopathy. So we decided to do a decimate uh, stripping automated endothelial keratoplasty for this patient. But during the surgery, you can notice that there is, there is aphakia and there is a lot of iris tissue loss. As soon as I implanted the lenticule, you can notice that just after injecting the air bubble, the graft, you can notice the graft slips down into the posterior segment. There was no chance to retrieve. The nightmare happened here. So finally, the patient was shown to a VR surgeon, and we plan to do a pass plan vitrectomy, DSEC lenticule explantation with the second uh, scleral fixated IOL implantation. DSEC uh, was not planned at this visit because uh, of the risk of high inflammation and graft failure at this, uh, 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 if it is done at the same sitting. During the surgery, the graft was noted to be lying folded on the inferior retina, 
the graft was carefully unfolded and with the help of a flute needle it was brought out through the temporal scleral incision as we noticed that the graft was looking viable and healthy uh, we plan to attach the same uh, dissect lenticule after performing the scleral fixated iol so the challenge here is how do you identify the correct orientation of the dislocated dissect graft uh, how what the few pointers are curvature of the donor lenticule the concavity of uh, towards upper side indicates that the endothelium is on the upper part and the convexity toward uh, indicates the stromal side the folded appearance of decimate membrane the fine stromal fibers staining of the stromal side of disc and stress the endothelium with trypan blue gentian violet marking on the stromal side before implantation also will help you point towards uh, identifying the correct orientation as you can see the below image shows after soaking in uh, ringer lactate the curvature Ident uh, takes up the normal curvature of the cornea, uh, helping in identifying the orientation. One one more tip is in FAQ cases and iris tissue loss, always try to maintain a full chamber air bubble. Do not replace the air bubble with saline because on change of posture, the air bubble tries to escape into the posterior segment. So coming back to our case, this uh, case uh, uh, had good outcomes with uh, nearly 20 best character visual equity of 2160 at the end of six months. You can see that on diffuse and slit lamp image. The lenticule was compact and uh, the corneal, the uh, host stroma was compact and the lenticule was well attached. Uh, this is supported by anti resigment OCT findings. At six months visit, the cornea is pretty compact. Uh, so uh, looking at the literature review, there were few cases reported. Afshari et al. reported eight cases. Only in, the, in, the, in that case series, only one case had a uh, successful outcome where the lenticule was reattached at the same sitting. But in our case, we reattached 26 hours later. If you delay more than that, you can have inflammatory changes and the graft will not be viable. So in our case, the estimated endothelial cell loss at the end of six months was 71.3%. The normal uh, expected endothelial cell loss in DSEC cases is 34 to 38% reported. Ours is more than twice uh, of that uh, uh, reported previously. But uh, when tissue availability is challenging, the same lenticule can be utilized for reattachment. But when uh, you have a good tissue available, it is always a better choice to uh, order a new tissue and uh, use it for DSEC. So here are my takeaway points. Prompt retrieval and reattachment of drop DSEC may have good outcomes. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you. It was brave of you to use the same tissue, especially in an institute when uh, tissue is available. I think, uh, I, I don't know what the other status was it AFA kick? Because the choice of doing an AFA kick DSEC, uh, I'm not quite sure why you all made that decision. You could have had a planned SFIO with a DSEC in the first right. sitting itself. But having said that, like let's say it's a one-eyed patient where you don't want to put an IOL and you want to leave an AFA kick, uh, patient AFA kick and do a DSEC. I think they've also reported where you can pass a suture through yes, the yes. Right. stromal uh, end of the you know disc and like use that to, uh, so that you know you, you don't have a dislocation into the vitreous. So these that that is an important uh, point which we can remember. Yeah, suture pull through technique can be adapted. Yes, yeah. that, that also you. helps. Otherwise, I, I would say it's a well managed, uh, bravely managed case. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So adventurous surgery, I would say, and yeah. with very yeah. good results and good documentation. Are you considering publishing it, or it is already published? Yeah, sent to BMJ case reports. Yeah. All the best. Thank you. Maybe Thank we you. can keep the sheet slides in before uh, and inject the air bubble and wait for 10 minutes, whether it is attaching, and then remove the sheet slides. Yeah, that's also a good suggestion. You know. Yeah. No, you can keep the sheet slides in. Make a large bubble, give 10 minutes, it will attach, and then remove the sheet slide. A small bubble will work when there is uh, iris here. She also had aniridia. That's Complete why I feel total, that you know, yeah, either using an aniridia IOL or SFIOL would have been a better choice. I don't know what was the reason that was not decided. And if you don't want to do any of it, passing a suture, I have done myself, it really works well. You have to keep yes. the suture uh, till you finished your case. Yeah, yeah thank, thank you. you. Uh, we can have the next speaker, uh, Dr. Rohit. From the panel, he is moving to the podium. He's talking on a case of recalcitrant fungal calcite. Okay, good morning, all. Thank you, AS committee, for giving me this opportunity. No financial disclosure. I will not bore you with this. So this is a case of 55-year-old female who was come symptomatic for 25 days. She gave it just a vague history of something has fallen in the eye 25 days ago, and the outside. Physician has prescribed natamycin and moxifloxacin, which she was using hourly. So vision in the right eye is HM plus, and this is the right eye status. You can see the nasal half of the cornea is having a 
deep stromal infiltrate and there is a hyperpion of 2.5 and if you see the arrow there is a bull leg and this is the set picture which can show that in infiltrate is mainly located into the deep stroma and on the fluorescent stain picture there is no epithelial defect now what will you do so I planned and this is the B scan which is absolutely normal so we suspected it is clinically fungal and we planned for endoscraping and if the something comes on the smears then inject antifungal intracamerally so day one endoscraping nothing came we started on routine uh, we don't start uh, empirical antifungal if there is no fungus and we just give a uh, fortified antibiotic ciflox and cifazolin day seven she worsened there is a more than half chamber hypopion b scan is absolutely normal so i still thought that we should find out the organism we again did the endoscraper and again i repeated the scraping again i sent the results for the microbiology it, nothing no organism so the day 14 fourth visit so that visit I thought now there are two options, whether you do biopsy or you take the patient for therapeutic PK. So at this visit I decided okay I will do therapeutic PK and will do intracomunal back scraping which will, which will, uh, it, which, uh, from which we can I reach the deeper part where the exits were locating for, uh, with the back scraping. So these were the, the uh, donor details, 71 year uh, tissue preserved in AMK it was used and the uh, operatively we find out that the, the, uh, the graft infiltrate was pretty much large it was not very uh, 10 to 10 mm and we took 11.5 mm graft again in drops coronal scraping negative again i send the intro exit that also negative this is the post of day one so now we have a we have done a therapeutic pk in a mk patient we don't know the etiology so post operative whether we will start steroid or not it's a question so what you can do is you don't start steroid on day one just wait for two three days check for the histopathology or check for check for the half corneal button so i waited for th uh, two days and second day the half corneal button showed fungus so i added antifungal in the form of natamycin and oral uh, ketoconazole and this is the day 14 picture there is no recurrence no residual inf uh, residual of uh, fungus infection so at day 14 i started added the steroids not one hourly still because it was a large graft not sure that it can uh, recurrence can happen again so six times i added and the half cb showed fusarium saloni and by the time mr pathology report has also come and it has shown this fungal filament so this was the pre-op course multiple ac wash multiple endoscraping four scraping either two endoscraping three corneal scraping three times ac wash Not, nothing came and this is a post-operative course patient at six months doing well 20 hundred waiting for the cataract surgery Learning points, always try to find the etiological organism which is causing the keratitis. Don't start empirical antifungal treatment. Don't wait too much if the patient is worsening like I, uh, after two weeks I uh, planned for therapeutic PK. And in case where the, you don't know the etiology before doing surgery, histopath and half corneal button will guide you the, what the post-op treatment will, you will start. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Roy. These are the frustrating cases and uh, well documented. I agree with you that, uh, you know, maybe early diagnosis would have helped. Maybe in your initial, when you did your AC tap, uh, also a corneal biopsy at that point would have helped. But ultimately, sometimes these deep stromal infiltrates do not respond and therapeutic PK is the only answer. Only point I had to make is probably I would wait uh, for at least two weeks or wait for the culture report before starting steroids, you know, if I'm... Yeah, um, I, I started after two weeks only. Two weeks, okay. Yeah, I yeah. thought you said two days. No, no, two, two weeks. Two weeks is... Uh, the waiting. second day, half coronal button showed fungus. I waited for two weeks. Two weeks. After two weeks All only. Right. Okay, so yeah, it's a great, well-managed case. But early, maybe in the initial AC tab, do you think a coronal biopsy at that point... Uh, yeah, Would I was waiting for one or two or two weeks. Yeah. So at two weeks, I at yeah, two because weeks. Because anyways, you've taken the patient up in the yeah. operating room. A corneal biopsy at that point would have given you a yeah. diagnosis, yeah. and then an intrastromal, probably voriconazole injection would have also. I don't give like empirical. If, Not if empirical. I, if the corneal biopsy. Yeah, if it shows you, fungus, then I, yeah. Then you and then an yeah. intrastromal also takes care of these deep uh, yes. deep infiltrates, and then you can end up with a nice scar and eventually plan yeah. PK later. But yeah, well managed case. Thank you. Thank you. Can we have the next speaker, please? Yeah, so why? Yeah. Uh. Yes, that was the message of this case that in cases which are progressively worsening, uh, do a early therapy. So the my case, the infiltrate was mainly the nasally. Yeah. That's exactly what he's saying. So 
either we go ahead and do a biopsy early if it's not responding or we do an early uh, PK because these are looking, it's looking very much like fungus. We know it's not going to respond even to your medical. Intrastromal, yes, uh, uh, voriconolol does work, but for that also you need a diagnosis. My threshold to do keratoplasty would have been much uh, lower. I would have done it much earlier. Thank you. Yes, please go ahead. So, a tale of viral keratitis with masquerading fungal infection. A long way to reach the happy ending. A 72-year-old male patient who is a farmer by occupation came with chief complaints of redness and defective vision in the left eye since one month. He had no history of trauma or past use of any topical or native medications. So on sweat lamp examination, 4 mm central stromal haze, iris clumps on the back of the endothelium with 1 mm streak hyperpion was noted. There was gross reduction in corneal sensations, patent syringing, KO scrapings, and gram stain was negative. So a provisional diagnosis of viral stromal keratitis was made. Topical steroids in tapering doses, cycloprojects, and oral acyclovir in twice daily dose was given. Improvement on follow-up visits was seen over a span of three months, quite surprisingly. So on the fourth month of follow-up, 4 mm central epithelial defect was seen with overlying 4 mm pigmented dry looking infiltrate and 3 mm hyperpion. He again gave no recent history of trauma. So KO scraping showed fungal filaments. Culture sensitivity was positive for dermatitis fungi. So that's why we started with topical natamycin, oral ketoconazole, along with oral acyclovir. AC wash with intracameral voriconazole, vanco, and imipenem was given. Intrastromal vosal was also planned. Still, there was no clinical and symptomatic improvement on subsequent follow-ups. So B scan revealed moderate vitreous echoes in the anterior and midvitreous cavity. So intracameral, intravitreal, intrastromal voriconazole were given after two weeks. Still, there was persistence of 4 mm central epithelial defect with overlying 4 mm pigmented dry looking infiltrate and 2 mm hyperpion. So lastly, we planned an AMG overlay for the persistent epithelial defect, which led to complete healing of the infiltrate along with adjuvant topical and oral medications. The patient showed improvement in vision to 6 by 24 by Snell and Schall. So it was continued on oral acyclovir prophylactically for six more months. As we can see, the B-scan was also normal. So why this case? Two schools of thoughts. A case of fungal keratitis, which on presentation with 4 mm stromal haze and 1 mm hyperpion with grossly reduced uh, corneal sensations was misdiagnosed as viral keratitis. The patient was started on topical steroids and oral acyclovir. Although there was initial improvement, there was worsening of the clinical picture later, probably due to residual nidus of fungal infection, which may have been present, which aggregated on use of topical steroids over a long period of time. So this led to persistent epithelial defect, fungal infiltrate, and hyperbion. So let's also not forget that he's a farmer by occupation. Or this might be a case of viral stromal keratitis, which responded on management with topical steroids and oral acyclovir. This was superimposed with fungal infection on subsequent follow-ups, maybe because of past history of trauma, which the patient is not giving us. Hence, the patient responded to topical, or oral, and intracameral and intrastromal antifungal medications along with AMG overlay for persistent epithelial defect. Oral acyclovir, uh, acyclovir was uh, continued in follow-up visits due to past history of stromal keratitis for the patient. So is this a case of viral keratitis with masquerading fungal infection, or is this a case of uh, fungal keratitis with masquerading viral infection? So which case scenario do you agree with? Is this that a course correction has been done, or we were right from the first thing? We have to both. Thank you, Dr. Somia. <laughs> yeah, like initial when the patient presented, was there an epithelial defect? No. So I think uh, your second uh, hypothesis, I, I feel less more likely that it was a viral keratitis, stromal endothelitis or keratitis. To begin with, the patient was a uh, farmer with some trauma, and then there is a superimposed fungal infection because. To see a fungal keratitis with no epithelial defect is absolutely very, very rare. I mean, I haven't seen yet in my 15 years of practice. Like if hypopion is there and there is epithelial defect, it could be accessory, NSK. But if there is hypopion and there is no epithelial defect, unlikely that it is. Yes. Uh, very unlikely to it's be fungal. Fungal. Yes, yes. Likely. Okay. Non viral. So. So it's a clinical conundrum and often one has to wait for steroids, give a oral acyclovir and topical antifungals, allow for the infiltrate to resolve for two to three weeks and then start steroids for the HSV. And usually six to eight weeks treatment is required in these cases. 
so good tough challenging case good job and oru as a club is also five times like the two times will not ಮೋಸ Uh, so we don't have her. So Dr. Saloni Sinha, she's talking on concomitant bilateral candida and a zero positive patients with dry eye. Good morning. I'm Dr. Saloni Sinha and I would be presenting a case on concomitant bilateral candida keratitis with dry eye in a HIV zero positive patient. lights are not moving someone from av please help us yeah so candida keratitis is an opportunistic opportunistic infection which usually occurs in an already compromised cornea the abnormal cornea in cases of dry eye syndrome chronic ulceration and possibly hiv infection predisposes the eye to candida infection our case is that of a 48 year old male hailing from andhra pradesh who presented with complaints of both eye redness watering discharge foreign body sensation and diminution of vision since one month he uh, gave us a history of exposure to some chemical fumes at his workplace one month back details of which were not known and he was diagnosed with bilateral toxic keratitis elsewhere four days back and was on early steroids antibiotics and lubricants he was also a diagnosed case of hiv with cd4 count of 270 and was on antiretroviral therapy since 15 years on examination his visual acuity was counting finger 1 meter in the right eye and counting finger close to face in left eye both eyes showed mevomitis his cornea in the right eye showed epithelial defect measuring approximately 9 into 8 mm with multiple whitish infiltrate while that that in left eye uh, again showed epithelial defect measuring 7 into 5 mm with multiple whitish infiltrate and also corneal stromal edema with dm folds so corneal scraping was done in both the eyes and samples were sent for uh, smear and culture examination his grams staining and koh calcofluor white revealed uh, budding e cell with pseudo hyphae and a diagnosis of candida was made and he was started on early voriconazole carboxymethyl cellulose atropin sulfate three, three times a day and tablet ketoconazole 200 mg twice daily and he was called for follow up in 3 days uh, in 3 days the culture report had come and in the left eye it grew east which was subsequently identified as candida he was improving so same medication was continued however 5 days later he uh, presented again and he had developed hypopion in both his eyes and also a persistent epithelial defect like picture so a repeat scraping in this stage was done to rule out any secondary infection which in left eye revealed gram positive cocci so all the previous medications were continued and he was also started on fortified cefuroxim 5% and ofloxacin 0.3% in both his eyes and also hpmc gel was added bt Uh, so we can see that his right eye continued to improve uh, over a period of 5 weeks with uh, pinhole visual acuity reaching 2040 however that was not not the situation in left eye which kept on worsening initially developed thinning which did not improve after application of cyanoacrylate glue and bcl and then amg was planned but even after that it perforated and it was taken up for therapeutic penetrating keratoplasty after uh, therapeutic penetrating keratoplasty again he developed infiltrate at one side over which t- uh, an impending perforation over which ta bcl was done the patient is still on follow up with us and uh, th- his infiltrate in left eye is consolidating and uh, he is doing well as of now so i would like to conclude by saying that candida keratitis is a vision threatening opportunistic infection which disproportionately affect a cornea which is compromised by conditions such as dry eye despite correct diagnosis and appropriate antifungal therapy the ocular com- complications can be devastating especially in immunocompromised cases and often require surgical management thank you for your attention so thanks and uh, candida is difficult to treat and one has to give uh, amphotericin b and also a oral uh, antifungal antimycotic uh, let's have some inputs from the audience as well what they would have done agree disagree i see dr sudhakar i see dr madhukar and dr varsha so we have many stalwarts with us here 
No, it's okay. I mean, that's perfectly understandable, but yeah, yeah. So the story is a seropositive with candida infection, keratitis, bilateral, perforation, inferior perforation. Why one eye is responding and other eye is deteriorating? That's that's uh, infection for us, I think you know. Like that's the myriad. One eye completely dissolved. And there is also a there is also a neurotrophic component. Which yeah. Might be. There is the there is an underlying systemic ill, uh, you know, immunocompression. So so these cases behave in a atypical manner. So uh, we need to be ready with with all possible modalities over here. Uh, CD4 count last time when he presented he. Uh, it was done in November 2022. Can we have a slide back up? And uh, it was 270. Slide. Then again in June, it was repeated like and that. it improved to 1,000. So twice it was, uh, he has been following up with us for last five months. So. I commented that sometimes you will see people on eight cycles, they have to come. Then you realize why it is correct. Because the body immune system is not working. Maybe we should have used amphotericin B in the starting because boriconazole. Uh, there were few studies which showed that boriconazole works as effective as amphotericin B with less surface toxicity. Yeah, but the mechanism is different. Amphotericin acts as a, by creating a pores in the membrane, and boriconazole is inhibiting the new formation. So already whatever organism fungus is there, it will not act on that. Combining them. Yes. yes. Thank you. Thank you, Sarani. Thank you. And, uh, I think one speaker was missing. Has the speaker come back? Come here. So if not, then we close this session early. <laughs> thank and, uh, you. Thank you very much, everybody, for your patient hearing.